Okay, we are. Okay. okay, we are ready whenever you are. Okay. Um, hi, people. Um, I wasn't expecting a Zoom webinar. I wish I could like see who's in the audience, but um, welcome to um, day one, panel two um, of Women in the Silent Screens online conference. This is a panel on Shanghai Early Cinema. I'm Rita Rongyi Lin, and I'm the chair of this panel. I, um, I'm delighted to be joined by Yu Mo Yan and Eileen Zhou today. And you can find our full bios on the Women in Film History website. So we'll have um, a full Q&A after our presentations, but if you have questions for a particular panelist, you can also just put them up in the chat. Um, you don't have to wait until the end of all the presentations because I imagine that can take a while to type up your questions um, and we'll just collect them at the end. Um, so we will start with um, my presentation. I am a PhD candidate in the Screen Cultures Program at Northwestern University, my dissertation explores the representation of female spectatorship in transnational film history. Um, and my presentation today is titled Shanghai Silent Cinema and the Melodrama of Feminist Film Historiography. Okay, um, so let me start with kind of a quick caveat that this is um, slightly shorter than 20 minutes, partially because my in-person um, allotted time was 15 minutes and I like wrote it as a 15 minute presentation and partially because I have COVID right now and I haven't been like in the best kind of work productivity. So I do apologize if this is um, less than complete. Um, and I wanted to give a little bit of context for the larger project that um, I'm working on. So this paper is part of a dissertation chapter I am writing um, about female spectatorship, melodrama, and some attempts in contemporary Chinese cinemas to remake the fallen women or new women legacy of 1930s Shanghai period, including Stanley Kwan's center stage, which is what my paper today is about. Um, hold on, let me see if I can minimize this. Okay. Um, and also Xu Jinglei's letter from an unknown woman from 2005. As Miriam Hansen famously proposed with her vernacular modernism thesis, the fallen women melodramas of Shanghai were always a transnational phenomenon in dialogue with classical Hollywood cinema of the time, which partially supports my methodology for reading these remakes as performing a melodramatic meta historiography in their own right. With that in mind, this paper follows two major strands of argument. First, that the temporal aesthetics of feminist film historiography often parallel those of melodrama by sharing in their affective propensities for loss. And two, that this parallel allows us to negotiate an alternative iteration of female spectatorship, which maintains an ideological distance from the kinds of over-identification and over-investment typically associated with women's genres, even while borrowing from their formal attributes in creating this distantiating effect. Um, and I consider these framings to be relatively speculative um, and open and really kind of a starting point for thinking about female spectatorship's relationship to film history. Um, and I expect this to be a case study among others that um, we can discuss that question through. Um, what does it mean to write a feminist film history of absences when we think and talk about films whose archival bodies did not survive, spectacular screen personas lost to time? What disaffective modalities are available for the feminist historian? To what extent can doing history be likened to a spectatorship written with pathos as we try to reconcile with decades of early cinema, untold stories, and women dispossessed by grand narratives whose fragmented remains continue to haunt the contemporary imaginary? These are the questions Stanley Kwan's 1991 film Center Stage takes up in not just revisiting the new women as fallen women legacy of Shanghai cinema, but performing the often intimate labor of doing feminist film history. Marketed as the previously untold real story of the 1920s silent film star Ren Lingyu and starring Maggie Chan as her, 
Center Stage remixes the genres of biopic, melodrama, and documentary in presenting the actress's tormented love life against Republican Shanghai's intertwined cinematic and political histories. Juxtaposing archival footages, interviews, dramatic reenactments, and fourth wall breaking appearances of Maggie Chan as Dan Lee Kwan as themselves actress and director, the film maintains a careful distinction between its many intricate layers of extra diegesis. Um, a brief breakdown or narrative segmentation will allow us to see that the film operates on one, the personal love personal life of Ren Ling Yu, which takes place in 1920s to 30s Shanghai, um, and two, the films of Ren Ling Yu, which take place um, since a lot of her films were in contemporary settings in a fictional um, but contemporaneous Shanghai, and third, the present 1990s Hong Kong, where Stanley Kwan discusses Ren with the rest of the crew, and Maggie Chan plays Ren Ling Yu in the above two capacities. So the tension between these registers becomes most dramatized during any scene in which a filming set occurs as part of the diegetic installment. So kind of the, the silent clip that we just watched, which occurs um, pretty early on in the film. Moments when we're watching Maggie Chan playing Ren Li Yu, playing a character, which effectively adds yet another layer of diegesis where Chan is arguably playing herself, depending on um, whether we take that appearance to be staged or indexical or both. That is, our access to the fictional 1920s, 30s Shanghai cinematic legacy is also doubly mediated, or indeed twice removed. Our narrative immersion to the first register is always obstructed by the metaleptic withdrawal of the third. Moreover, the second register pieces together Ren's original performances with Chun's reenactments, where original prints of Ren are not available offering the room to contemplate absence through an image of its double. My consideration of center stage as lending itself to a disaffective mode of female spectatorship that puts feminist film historiography on a par with melodrama rests on the way in which these reenactments foreground the archival loss of Ren. By collapsing three planes of tragedy, the fallen women narrative, Ren's personal life and eventual suicide, the rise and fall of left-wing filmmaking in the 1930s, the film allows us to map the temporal registers of melodrama onto film history. Too late, if only in the nick of time. If Center Stage makes use of the formal attributes of melodrama in telling a story not just about the past, but also of what it means to think about the past from the historical present, I propose then it is possible to draw from the aesthetics of melodrama, pathos, catharsis, and distanciation in imagining alternative engagements with feminist film history beyond revisiting, recovering, or representing those that are rooted through hope, disappointment, and dispossession. As Steve Neal describes in Melodrama and Tears, poignancy and pathos arise as an effect of knowledge discrepancy between the spectator and the character, where the spectator knows more. This is frequently the case with the dramatic biopic where the spectator always comes with some degree, or already comes um, with some degree of prior knowledge about the life portrayed, but still enjoys the narrative for its procedural affect. What is impossible is not change as such, but the spectator's ability to intervene in it and make the change. Similarly, Linda Williams writes about melodrama's relationship to temporal irreversibility or reversibility as that which does not always move towards a new future, but moves to restore some semblance of a lost past. Additionally, melodrama's emotional hyperbole is often marked by blockages to the fulfillment of desire. In this sense, center stage as a meta biopic elicits pathos on the plane of history by signaling its own lack of fulfillment through these original print lost subtitles. For Kwan as a feminist historian, the affective stakes of doing history are the formal structuring principle as well as narrative motivation of the film as an archival hunt for Ren Li Yu. If the implicit desire in question is that of reconstructing a holistic image of Ren and Republican sh Shanghai filmmaking by extension, the film ultimately undermines this image by highlighting the visible incompleteness and lack in the archive it is trying to assemble out of Ren. In doing so, it transforms itself into a melodrama of feminist film historiography by effectuating history writing into an affective genre and spectatorship.
Um, so I'm going to play the clip that um, I will do a post reading of in a moment. <laughs> I have been using the word um, affect rather loosely up to this point to denote a kind of emotional response to loss and tragedy. The literature on melodrama, often theorized as a female or a feminized genre, has tended to equate this emotional response unequivocally with tears. Indeed, as the term weepies suggest, the women's film has come to be associated with crying as a powerful and perhaps involuntary real somatic effect of narrative over identification and emotional over investment for the female spectator, or as Marianne Doan has observed, proximity rather than distance from the image. But center stage asks, can one maintain an ideological or critical distance from the image, which does not necessarily become artifice, but real insofar as one performs the emotional labor of engaging with the image. In what follows, I offer close reading of the fourth wall breaking or eighth wall breaking sequence in center stage in which Ren Dash Chun's crying comes to mediate the paratextual and discursive tensions around melodrama and female spectatorship. Keeping with what I have called procedural affect, 
of watching a fictionalized biography unfold, I suggest that Maggie Chan's performatively laborious crying body signifies an intellectually distancing and historically retrospective positionality that invites new takes on female spectatorship as a disaffected modality. So the sequence we just watched takes place on the diegetic dieg dieg register of Ren Liu playing a fallen woman on the set of New Women, directed by Tsai Shusheng in 1935, after several failed takes on what the director deemed was an insufficient performance due to lack of emotional immersion, Ren Liu is advised to think of her personal life and the scandal of Wei Ming in order to re resonate with her character so that her tears would be more method, so to speak, more realistic. Um, and that the narrative implies that acting through the story would be cathartic for Ren, Ren Yu herself as someone experiencing similar stories. She does as she is told, and it was a great take. Tsai Chu Sheng yells cut, the lights turn off, the show's over, but she continues to sob involuntarily. She lays on the bed and proceeds to wrap herself with the bed sheets, hiding her entire body under until only the acousmatic sound of her crying is present. Tsai walks over to sit on the edge of her bed and looks at her solemnly. A close-up of the bed sheets. Suddenly, the scene has imperceptibly shifted to black and white as we zoom out to reveal the larger 1990s filming studio in which this mise on a beam had taken place. And then Stanley Kwan yells cut and says to Tony Long, who plays Tsai Chu Sheng, you forgot to lift the bed sheets off of Maggie. What, how does it feel to watch or hear someone cry from under the blanket? When crying has been theorized as a formal, however, paratextual attribute of melodrama's female spectatorship, it is rarely itself a structuring component of the genre. To be clear, I am not talking about the last shot of Stella Dallas or any crying female character in a melodrama, but the self-reflexive installation of a supposedly crying female spectator, the impossible or the un unrepresentable. In this sense, I wish to take up the unfinished business of examining, as Marianne Jones does in The Desire to Desire, the representation of female spectatorship in the women's film. It has not always been addressed exactly how one cries at the movies, more so only that one does, or that one supposedly does. Arguably the most pathos eliciting and emotional, emotionally cathartic scene of the film this crying does not demand an identification or even narrative immersion, but in fact reminds us of its stagedness by nudging the spectator to pay attention to the edges of the canvas, where the blanket comes to mirror or be doubled as a screen or veil. So that any effectively embodied spectatorship we had been feeling up to this point actually becomes foregrounded as a performance. Center stage formally organizes crying in such a way as to withdraw from its emotional intensity by first concealing the action, however conspicuously, under the bed sheets, and rendering it a disembodied voice, and then further removing itself by zooming out and signaling the constructed nature of the scene within the scene. In actualizing the would-be tears of melodrama's classic female spectator, the doubled figure of Ren Dash Chung dis distantiates the supposed body genre of melodrama and crying as a somatic response by presenting instead an affectively and performatively laboring body in and of history. Indeed, it is too much to look at, so much so that no one looks away. I have suggested some ways in which center stage might offer a gender group vision to spectatorship as not necessarily about looking, but feeling and performing, on which a conceptual parallel between melodrama and feminist film history might be drawn. Furthermore, the intellectual distance the film maintains between the levels of immersion and reenactment intervenes against a stereotypical over-identifying melodramatic feminine feeling. Not unlike Benjamin's Angel of History, the fallen woman functions as a figure of feminist film historiography, standing at the crossroads of tradition and modernity, personal and national, local and global. What might be gained from triangulating these various layers of text and metatext is a mode of feminine spectatorship that departs from any gender subject a priori, but one that mediates the complex social cultural tensions at the levels of representation, discourse, and history. Should I 
start. Sorry, I think my like laptop is. Oh, okay, it's back on. Um, cool. And next up, we have um, Yu Mo Yan. Um, she is a second year PhD student at the Cinema and Media Studies program at the University of Washington. And the paper she is giving today is called Claiming Modernity Class Based Female Movie Going in 1920s and 1930s Shanghai. Thank you, Rita, um, <clears throat> for such an interesting and rich presentation. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So hi, everyone. Um, the title of my presentation is At the Intersections of, Gen of Class and Gender, um, Lower Class Women's Movie Going in 1920s and 1930s Shanghai. So I've changed my title, and I will explain why I did that later. So my project explores um, the ways that Chinese lower class women who went to the movies were uh, stereotyped in Republican era patriarchal and elitist discourses. This project stems from my observation that the issues of class and gender have never been addressed in studies of Shanghai moviegoers. Before I, I explain what that means, I wanna start with some statistics for anyone who's not familiar with the Shanghai film scene. So there were both uh, foreign known and Chinese owned theaters um, in the 1920s and 1930s, there were also like the co-funded theaters uh, between uh, foreign businessmen and Chinese businessmen. So well, foreign owned theaters screened mostly, if not exclusively, uh, imported American and French films while Chinese owned venues mainly showed uh, domestic productions. All of these theaters were divided into a uh, first run, second run, third run, and even fourth run theaters, um, hierarchized by their uh, film selections, interior settings, and ticket prices. For example, uh, the Odeon Theater uh, that we see here, perhaps the most famous theater in Shanghai for its uh, architect, uh, for its Ar Ar Deco, um, architectural design, had first run screening rights to uh, Paramount and Universal's films. An example of a Chinese owned first run theater is um, the uh, Jincheng Grand Theater that we see on the right, uh, which premiered a lot of films from the Chinese production company Bianhua. Second run or third run theaters, on the other hand, had to wait a while to screen a new film. So I've placed here an advertisement from the newspaper Da Gong Bao um, of what different theaters were showing on the day, June 6th, 1936. As we see here, um, Da Gong Ming Theater is, uh, was showing the new film, um, the 1936 uh, film, The Singing Kid, starring Al Johnson. And uh, the Nanjing Theater was showing the 1936 version of A Small Town Girl. Other theaters were showing earlier films um, like uh, the 1934 uh, uh, MGM production, Tarzan and His Mate, and also a uh, 1928 Chinese film, uh, Bai Yun Ta, star starring uh, Hu Die, Butterfly Hu. Other than the films that they screened, the infrastructure of the cinemas also helped determine their ranking. First run movie palaces had the most luxurious set settings and up-to-date equipment, while third run theaters often renovated from traditional tea houses and opera houses offered less advanced establishments. For instance, the Odeon Theater ad here boosted of its out of this world projection, decoration, ventilation, and individualized setting. Yet by the late 1930s, many third run theaters still used long benches to seat several people. And also because we're in the summer, despite um, Shanghai's blazing hot summer month, by 1936, only first run theaters and a few second run theaters had installed air conditioners, which shows the uh, material conditions, um, the differences between uh, theaters of different ranks. So the diverse, the diverse packages of films and physical conditions of watching resulted in greatly varied ticket prices. Although ticket prices fluctuate over the decades, I want to zoom in on the year 1927 to make my argument. So 1927 was the year when um, the Chinese writer Xu Shihun published his um, encyclopedia of, of the Shanghai film industry titled Filmdom in China. And in there, he notes that the ticket price for a first run theater uh, ranged from one to three Chinese dollars, um, second run theaters from 40 to 80 cents, and third run theaters from 10 to 20 cents. I want to cross compare this with another set of data. A 1929 statistical report by the Bureau of Social Affairs of Greater Shanghai estimated that the female worker in cotton mills and silk villages, the two uh, largest light manufacturing industries, earned on average six to 10 Chinese dollars monthly, which roughly accounts for um, the mean of Shanghai's uh, working class women's average salary. 
This report also tells us that in the light industrial sector, women on average earned less than men, which is not surprising. If we compare a working class women's wages with the ticket prices to cinemas, a conclusion can be made. It is very unlikely that the average working class women would use more than 10% of her mon monthly earnings to buy even the cheapest ticket at a luxury theater. Thus, the venues that lower working class women could afford were the second and third run theaters. This leads to a question. If the Republican era Shanghai film scene is known for its cosmopolitanism, its grand movie palaces and the easy access to latest Hollywood films, what about lower cost patrons who could not afford these venues? How do we characterize their movie going experiences? I want to make three claims in my presentation. The first one is studies of Shanghai cinema have never addressed the issue of class and gender in its audiences. The intersections of class, gender, and spectatorship have been neglected under prior scholarships concerned with an overarching group of audience called the petty urbanities or Sao Shimin. For instance, uh, Zhang Zhang's and Moria's history of the silver screen and Liu Fan Li's um, Shanghai Modern both use petty urbanities to uh, describe the majority of Shanghai's cosmopolitan moviegoers. However, Sao Shimin, petty urbanities, by their definition, is a broad and vaguely defined social body, including uh, street vendors, clerks, students, actors, migrants, courtesans, and middle lower cost men and women in general. Within petty urbanities, emerging white collar bank clerks are matched together with lower working class factory workers, but in reality, they go to theaters of different ranks and encounter vastly different movie going experiences. While the use of Xiao Shimin or petty urbanities might have aided Zhang and Li's initial projects to uncover a vernacular and cosmopolitan movie going scene in Shanghai, the continuous usage of petty urbanities to generalize Shanghai audiences neglects concrete class-based differences of movie going while also glosses over gendered experiences of, of women. Consequently, I turn to lower class women in my project, specifically to members of the lower ends of the working class, populated by female blue collar workers, whose meager earnings afforded them occasional trips to lower ranking theaters. So why are lower class women worth addressing, other than the fact that, according to reception studies, we should pay attention to every possible movie going experience out there? I argue that it is through focusing on lower class women that we can actually find similarities between how lower class women were viewed by intellectuals in the Shanghai context and American and French ones. I'm referring specifically to um, Shelley Stamp's work on movie struck girls and Annie Thies' work on the French Minette, but other scholars like Kathy Pace and Miriam Hansen have also worked on similar issues. Shelley Stamp argues that American cinema's elevation from lowbrow Nickelodeons to refined entertainment was due to the industry's catering to middle-class women at the expense of young working-class movie struck girls. By rejecting the overly emotional and narcissistic type of movie-going of adolescent women, the industry repositioned itself as respectable, family-oriented entertainment. In the French context, Annie Fee examines the discourses of male cinephiles in the 1920s to argue that French film critics established their own legitimacy as the truest cinephile by defaming their working class female moviegoer as emblems of bad taste and over emotional spectatorship. The obsession that working class minettes had on serials was taken to be primitive modes of spectatorship far from the intellectual and the truly cinephilic. If we examine the Shanghai context, we can observe similar class and gender-based prejudices and stereotypes. Here's where I make my second claim. Like the movie Shrub Girl and the Minette, Chinese lower class women were also seen as a symbol of a primitive unruly spectatorship that poses a direct obstacle to Chinese intellectuals' project to elevate cinemas into places that adopt middle-class behaviors. Chinese cultural elites denounced lower caste women's communal way of spectatorship to legitimize hygienic, quiet, and absorbed ways of movie going. So the history of etiquette reform in Chinese cinemas is first noticed by uh, Zhu Wei Xiao in his um, 2006 essay. And it is on uh, Xiao's argument that I wish to base my findings. 
Bussell argues that um, starting from the latter half of the 1920s, Chinese intellectuals began staging the differences between going to a luxury theater and a second run or third run one. The luxury theater is often characterized as orderly, quiet, and hygienic, while lesser theaters are often the sites of unruly, unruliness and chaos. Some of the behaviors in the smaller theaters that were particularly criticized were uh, the selling of snacks by food vendors during the screening, and in general, the sonic chaos. Children yell and clap, people read subtitles out loud for their illiterate friends. They also chew on um, melon seeds and chestnuts, uh, which can be very loud. To correct these behaviors, uh, many essays were published on newspapers and film journals that advised the moviegoers to refrain from talking, uh, reading subtitles out loud, clapping during the intermissions, and in general, eating, drinking, smoking during the screening. What is interesting are the reasons given for some of these regulations. As observed by Xiao, and I've also encountered this in my archival research, intellectuals often justify the rules by looking towards more modernized countries. For instance, a 1925 and 1931 essay both stressed that smoking was prohibited in the auditorium in developed countries like Japan. When asking viewers not to read subtitles out loud, a 1928 article highlighted the severity of punishment such, as, such acts brought to an American moviegoer in New York. Under the crime of disrupting social order, the viewer was fined $25. So Sale accurately points out that the supposedly civilized conduct of foreigners did not wholly accord with reality. In the early days of film exhibition, American audiences were also rowdy. The conscious following of a Western model of appropriate behavior to replace traditional and unmodern ways of the Chinese is read by Xiao not as an act out of class interest, but as a part of China's nation building project to eradicate the colonialist image of the country as barbarian, chaotic, and disorderly. My point of view diverges from uh, Sao's in the importance that, that class played in the etiquette campaign. The so-called Western model was not uniformly adopted by all American theaters as soon as film exhibition entered into maturity. Studies of American uh, working class moviegoers, neighborhood theaters, and rural audiences have frequently shown that the Western model of appropriate behavior was in fact a middle-class construct that was not followed in working class and rural theaters. The supposed fine of $25 um, uh, stated as a warning um, in the Chinese article reminds me of an incident that Maggie Hanfield states in her study of women's hats in um, 1910s US theaters. She notes that while cinemas in Chicago claimed to fine $3 for women moviegoers whose hats obstructed the view of others, in reality, and I quote, no one would have attempted to fine a Nickelodeon or Dime Show spectator $3 for refusing to doff her hat, for which she may have neglected her basic functional needs in order to purchase. It can be equally inferred that a fine as large as $25 claimed by uh, this particular Chinese intellectual would almost never have been uh, imposed in working class theaters in the US. Thus, the Western model of appropriate behavior that Chinese intellectuals were promoting was none other than the conduct of an imaginary global middle class, which alienated smaller theaters targeting lower class audiences. And if you remember from our statistics earlier, the major patrons of these small theaters were exactly lower class women. I want to use a final example to show that um, Chinese lower class female moviegoers were specifically singled out to be representatives of bad taste. In uh, Xu Shihen's uh, film Dome in China, he observes that first run and second run theaters attract intellectuals, upper class and middle class patrons, and third run theaters were frequented by, I quote, women and children um, who only enjoy the low genres of martial arts films and slapstick comedies. He writes, and I quote, if films with artistic merits are shown, these women and children will not be satisfied because they could not comprehend. Note that by positioning women and children as a separate category outside of upper class and middle class, Su uses um, women and children as a stand-in for lower class movie goers. 
much like the case of U.S. movie struck girls and the French Minette, the Chinese lower class female moviegoer also stood for bad taste and unrefined ways of spectatorship, ones that need to be reformed in order to elevate Chinese theaters um, to a global middle class standard. So I, uh, by now, I mostly addressed discourses in my paper. Um, I deleted the phrase claiming modernity from my original title because within the time that I have, I could not get to the part where uh, I examine writings on newspapers and film journals and fictional works by uh, uh, Republican era uh, female writers um, who wrote stories of uh, lower class women who went to the movies to try and grant agency to these uh, less privileged sisters. Um, so basically, my project confronts a question shared by all studies on audiences. Um, that, that is, where are the voices of actual women in your work? And what do the audiences that you study really think of their own movie going experiences? And here's where agency can be granted, um, where the audience subjects can speak up against the rendered muteness in elitist and patriarchal discourses. And this issue is particularly throbbing in the case of Chinese lower class women um, in which their low levels, low levels of literacy uh, prohibits them from leaving any written choices of their own experiences. So this requires us to look for alternative materials like oral history, scrapbooks, memoirs, but they are, these kind of archives are no notorious and hard to find. So the question becomes, what can we do with this archival lack? So here's where uh, my third and final claim comes in. If we don't have new archives, why don't we rework the old? I argue that a vast, unexplored archive that tells us about um, Republican era female, like, that tells us about Republican Shanghai uh, women's movie going experiences are the fictional works of um, the female writer Eileen Chang. So my first claim is, or the, my third claim is this. Although Eileen Chang is probably the best known female cinephile in the whole of Chinese film history, she has never been seriously taken as a cinephile. Scholarship on Eileen Chung and cinema has centered on her role as scriptwriter and producer, not on her as an avid moviegoer. What if we take every fictional character in Chung's works at, to be actual women who really went to the movies and start asking questions like, what movies did they watch? What theaters did they go to? How did they regard their moviegoing experiences? I think Eileen Chang's works would constitute a vast and important and unexplored archive for uh, feminist film historiography. Thank you. So this is my bibliography. Great. Um, and then next up, we have Eileen Cho. Um, she has earned her MA degree in film and media studies at the School of Arts, Columbia University. Her major research interest is in Chinese film history, and she is now working on a project about cinema and socialist feminism in the Maoist era. Um, the paper she's giving today is titled Disguised or Exposed Female Identity Cross-Dressing in Early Chinese Cinema. Um, thanks, Rita. Okay, um, my topic, uh, my title has changed to playing with well, to, um, while we wait for people to um, type up their questions, um, I'll start with the question for you more. I really enjoyed that. Um, and because I'm not very familiar with the kind of historiography of this period. So one of my questions was, um, kind of how do you see your findings on um, female audiences and female movie going interact with existing discursive conceptions of female spectatorship, if any, in Chinese film studies? Because you like cite a lot of um, uh, kind of discursive formations of female spectatorship in, that, in other national contexts. Like, I'm thinking about how um, Shelley Stumm's work was um, and Miriam Hansen's work during that period were explicitly trying to work against how female spectatorship has been theorized as like impossible, um, as like this theoretical positionality that like is at odds with classical spectatorship. And it's interesting because kind of up until Shelley Stump had theorized that there was this, um, there was this understanding that maybe um, 
working class women went to the movies and therefore it was like this newfound space of mobility for women who couldn't have been in public space before but actually that they were deemed as like rude and loud and that just like ran odds with um, the kind of classical mode of capital-esque spectatorship that demanded immersion demanded focus that kind of thing so I, yeah I was just wondering if like in Chinese film studies um, of this period, was there kind of a capital S spectatorship or like female spectatorship that you think um, like female, like these findings on female reception and female movie going actually countered? Oh, thanks for the great question, Rita. Um, so I think, and I've been trying to deliver this through my presentation is that in, in the Republican era, there were also this ideal type of um, uh, spectatorship that is absorbed um, individualized and much like the classical spectatorship that um, um, like Hollywood was was then um, uh, promoting. And I think the reason for that is, and we can see this um, in a lot of newspapers, is because Chinese intellectuals were um, promoting their uh, this kind of ideal spectatorship and aligning it with um, what was done in more modernized countries, which is um, the uh, they cited uh, U.S. and Japan, and they um, they were saying that you know the spectators there were uh, very organized, they were quiet, they don't eat and drink. So, but that but that is sort of this. Um, that isn't, I mean, quiet spectatorship, I wouldn't say that's the norm. It's, it's an educated uh, and normalized middle-class construct um, that was, I guess, not followed in um, working class theaters globally, um, both, in, both in the US and um, also in Shanghai. And the, the editing campaign that uh, Chinese intellectuals were promoting never worked. Um, they were, um, it was like, you can find in, late 1930s and early 1940s uh, newspapers um, of them still saying the same things that they were talking about in the late 1920s. They were still saying that you shouldn't eat, we shouldn't talk, but no one listens because, and they were saying that, you know, in particular, we find that uh, third class, uh, third run theaters um, still adopt a kind of communal spectatorship and that's not good, but, you know, that shows that nobody listens to them because it, it just doesn't work in lower class, in working class theaters. So, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, um, while we're on that topic, I'm just gonna relay um, Jennifer Bean's question. Um, that was wonderful and very interesting presentation. You want, I'm curious to hear about what one of Chun's characters resembles, also what time frame she is writing. Uh, thank you, JV. Uh, so um, Eileen Chow started writing in the um, late 1930s and 1940s, and then she eventually moved. Uh, she moved from, uh, she was born in Beijing. She moved to Shanghai, and then um, she stayed in Shanghai for uh, quite a while. I mean, I, I guess Shanghai is probably her favorite city. And then she moved to Hong Kong, and then she moved to um, the, the US. So she, she was writing um, during her whole career, but uh, a lot of her works were um, centered on um, Shanghai, I guess, in the 1930s, 1940s. So um, she had, like, most of her stories were about uh, women, women at the time. Um, and uh, almost in all of her stories, uh, the female protagonists had to go at least once to a theater. And she would write, you know, she went to the theater. She watched, um, sometimes she would write, like, she watched uh, what kind of films, and she would describe her movie uh, going experience. For example, I remember there was a uh, um, a short novel. It's very short. I forgot the name, but she was saying that. Um, uh, so this this woman uh, arrived in Shanghai, and um, she was walking on the streets, and she sensed that a man was hailing her, and then she immediately went to a theater, sat down, and she felt that she felt safe. So I think these are interesting moments in um, Eileen Chang's works that probably gives us a sense of what um, movie going was like for, for Shanghai women at the time. So I felt that um, uh, if we take uh, Eileen Chang's fictional works to be you know, potential um, historical archives, then I think we can, th there's a lot to be said out of it. Thank you. Well, um, and then I will 
take a question from Han Xing Pan. Um, could you say a bit more about the relationship between center stage's mode of self-reflexivity and the affective aspect of melodrama? In other words, do you see the film's self-reflexivity as the effect of its adopting the melodramatic mode of stor storytelling in terms of revealing um, and drawing attention to archival absences? Um, thank you, that's a great question. Um, I think um, partially, I mean, I, I appreciate your use of the word self-reflexive here because I think center stage is melodramatic partially because it is like remaking the whole kind of melodramatic legacy. And so there is, I think um, the self-reflexive part of its storytelling is always inflected in the kind of affective stakes that um, melodrama as a genre we're always about so that I mean I don't think kind of the literature that I was looking at um, when I was writing this paper on melodrama and tears were necessarily using the word affect and I'm using the word affect very loosely but I think they were kind of the way that they talked about tears about melodrama as a moving genre and as a particular kind of feminized uh, feminine genre has a lot to do with affect and so there is a way in which like I'm using Stanley Kwan here, but like film is a collaborative process and I'm referring to like the film, the, the crew, et cetera, as a collaborative kind of subjectivity. Um, and I think like Stanley Kwan in, you know, being a feminist historian, revisiting this legacy um, and kind of rewatching a lot of um, Ren Liu's old films, old melodramas, I think, you know, sort of effectuates that. Um, affective spectatorship into a kind of laborious, you know, this performative spectatorship uh, of doing history. And that's something that I'm trying to work through, kind of like, is this something that, you know, like, obviously, I'm not trying to theorize those of you in the audience who are uh, feminist historians, but like, to what extent can like, doing history and like doing feminist film history, in particular, a history that is written with pathos, like with absences, with a lot of like misremembered stories, you know, about women's participation, especially like at the time that um, Center Stage came out, I think, you know, her like Ren Liu's life had been really misremembered up to that point. And I don't think the film is claiming to present the real story. In fact, I think it's being really self-reflexive about like, I am presenting like the version that I want to present about her from our like historical standpoint. Um, and like early on in the film, there was this like kind of caveat that like, that is like Stanley Kwan sort of telling Maggie about um, Ren Liu's life and asking like Maggie Chan, how would you like to remember it? So I think, you know, there are all these layers of diegesis where um, these questions are kind of um, framed really in, in a mise en beam fashion that I think is, yeah, really taps into your question. So thank you for that. Um, cool, and then we have a question for Eileen from Jennifer B as well. Um, the question of what sort of readings these cross-dressed women open up. Um, we just watched part of White Rose at the Lamb Fest on Sunday, and it seemed clear to me that there are elements of playing with male stars, especially Douglas Fairbanks, obviously, but importantly, Chaplin's shorts, like The Adventurer from 1997, 1917. This especially, this felt especially pal palpable in the scene on the balcony as White Rose runs up and down a trick of stairs um, and then swings back and forth on a rope between the two balconies. Might it be that mimetic replaying of the recognizable imported Western popular figures, including Pearl White, enabled these women to cross-dress in these ways? A long question I know, super exciting, unquote. Oh, thanks for the questions. Uh, yes, I agree because uh, Miriam Hans and Wei Hongbao has uh, have already written about the vernacular modernism and also the global circulation of Hollywood cinema and how it had impact on uh, early Chinese cinema in the uh, in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, I agree, it could be some direct references to a uh, Hollywood film like Chaplin's films, uh, but I still remain doubted whether we could call it uh, a, a kind of uh, 
direct influence or uh, uh, or, or or whether the the uh, female uh, the cross dressing uh, was a kind of influence by the Hollywood film because as I said before uh, there were long histories of uh, telling female representing stories in the Chinese literatures. So I, uh, I tend to believe it is a kind of combination, but not uh, a one direction influence between the, uh, the Hollywood and the Chinese early cinema. Um, looks like we don't have more questions now, just a comment. Thank you, Professor Bean. Um, and I have a question, like kind of a follow-up question for Eileen, um, since you changed your title to playing with femininity, like I'm really fascinated by like kind of the multiple meanings of the word play um, and kind of, and I guess this is an open question for um, you more and me, myself as well. Um, it's weird, like being a panelist and a chair at the same time. But like kind of um, since we're all trying to really like reconstruct agency and imagine agency through these like archival presences and lacks and like kind of to what extent it like to Eileen, like to what extent do you think playing like both kind of playing as in like, I'm just having fun and like playing as in, you know, I'm playing a version of myself where I'm playing a version of myself that like the patriarchy wants or is like subversive and queer, you know, et cetera. How does that, you know, help us reimagine this like different agency ascribed to like women's participation in early Chinese cinema um, and to you more like kind of, you know, if you see that because you mentioned the question of like, we can only get at them, like kind of, like what were these actual movie going experiences? Like how would they have felt about like us kind of re representing or like theorizing them? Um, and like to the, like to what extent are these kind of agencies always mediated through text and like um, these performances um, and kind of, yeah, like what kind of history can be done about um, like women's agency and like women's stories in general? A big question, I know. Thanks, Rita. It is really a good question for us three to have a further discussion. So to put it simply, I think uh, Yan Shenshan is a good example of female agency in the early Chinese film industry, like how she actually got involved with uh, uh, both acting and film production. Uh, but I use, I, I use the word playing with femininity because I think the cross-dressing uh, should be read in a more complicated way, but not just uh, like disguise. Because before my title was disguised or exposed female identity. But I think cross-dressing could have multiple meanings, uh, even for uh, we, we can see during this transitional period, the cross-dressing men and the cross-dressing women had different uh, implications or different targeted audiences, but, uh, but still it opened up space for both queer readings or other ways of reading it. And uh, I don't think uh, uh, like, it was merely a disguised or exposed uh, uh, female identity. It could exist at the same time. And also, I think uh, the early the early period was full of possibilities for women to discover to discover their own identities and agencies. Um, I have a question for you, Eileen, um, and I'm asking this because uh, I don't know how to answer your question, Rita. So uh, uh, my question is, um, I think it's interesting how uh, Wu Su-Xin and uh, Yuan Meiyun, they're, so the, the, the type of uh, men that they cross-dress as are actually quite different, right? Because we watched um, uh, a woman warrior, uh, White Rose, who, um, during yeah. the uh, conference, and uh, mm -hmm. she was she was turned like sh she put on this costume and this costume was like for me it was like cowboyish but i'm not sure how you uh -huh. would characterize it and Yuan Meiyun, um was um, dressed in this suit this very westernized suit 
and um, yes. she had her hair combed back, which was uh, sleek. Um, but it's interesting how they weren't that they didn't choose to dress as the traditional male, um, traditional Chinese men in, in, in a mm -hmm. sense, right? In, because at the, at the time, it, like men would have these long robes, right? I think, of mm -hmm. course, they would also dress in the suits. But I'm wondering if um, uh, if this uh, different type of masculinity that the uh, that the uh, women choose to cross dress as um, uh, like figure in your um, research. And what do you think about that? Uh, first, I don't think women or this actresses had had the, the opportunities to choose which to uh, which to cross dress, how they're going to cross dress like, but because you know the directors, uh, the, the film industry was still mainly male dominated. So I think, as I said before, it has its interaction with uh, the global cinema and also the Hollywood, the the Hollywood cinema. Uh, and also, I, I, I read about some readings of Yuan Meiyun's cross-dressing as another kind of modern girl, though this film doesn't uh, refer to this discussion directly, but uh, both, uh, the, the, both uh, the character in the film and also Yuan Meiyun herself uh, were considered as a kind of new woman at that moment in the public discourse. Um, we have another question from Lu Chen. I wonder if we could reconcile the weeping over identifying female spectators Rita discussed with the uncivilized roddy female spe spectators you more discussed. Are the weeping spectators ideal, non-existent, or just highly educated enough to understand the films? Um, I mean, yeah, I, I, I agree. There's like kind of a real dissonance or gap between how female spectatorship is theorized and like how female audiences actually behaved and like back to um, um, your more citation on Shelley Stamp, like kind of, you know, they were kind of too loud and rowdy to actually know what's happening on screen, let alone cry, right? And so, you know, there are these different ways in which female spectatorship has been theorized at different moments of like film history and like, the history of film studies, I guess. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think um, I would be open to the possibility of like female spectators crying at certain moments, like in early cinema, you know, in general, but kind of, I think the what center stage is trying to do is to like kind of maintain an ideological distance from that kind of spectatorship as a representation of spectatorship, which I think is always, um, a difficulty. Um, and yeah, like I would be curious as to see if there were um, characters or, or kind of women looking, like women in any kind of looking capacity, you know, like being a Flanez in the city or anything that like, um, for you more like the period that you're examining that you would see these like working class women could identify with, like if you think there are kind of those narratives or those characters. Yeah, I think um, an interesting piece of, uh, so a fictional story that I found um, on um, a, a film journal in I think 1937 was um, uh, someone uh, writing about a, um, a lower class woman going to the movies and she was so absorbed by the film. It, it, she was watching, um, uh, Yu Guang Chu, uh, um, and she was so absorbed by the film, and she the film is about um, a, a a fisherman's family making ends meet in Shanghai, and she was crying and 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 uh, yelling for uh, for the audiences to save these uh, fishermen um, when you know the, the fishermen drowned in the sea, and um, so. So that fictional story, I think, positions a um, lower class uh, female moviegoer as completely absorbed and I, the perfect ideal spectator because she was completely moved and she did she did not even know. So there was one incident in the in the story at the end of the story um, when the author was describing you know the lights turned on and the woman only sees a, a a screen but there's nothing behind the screen and she was like oh this is so weird and so this is I felt that. I tend to read these types of stories as um, uh, 
reversing the um, uh, rowdy type of um, like distracted spectator and but by showing a type of um, female movie goer as uh, completely absorbed and emotional. So I think that's that's um, that is a, a very interesting tie um, between um, mine and Rita's project. So thank you. Yeah, and I like I'm not sure if those are, and I'm not saying that's what you're suggesting, Lou, but like kind of I don't know if they're necessarily at odds. You know, if they are either like crying or they're highly educated and like we you know, we never cry at the movies or, or something. But yeah, you know, I, I, I definitely agree. There's something about kind of crying as like an attribute, maybe like associated with um, that kind of over identification that is a lack of, you know, critical ability to dis to distinguish um, between narrative and like uh, reality, etc. cetera. Um, okay, so we don't have any questions for now. Um, thoughts? I mean, I have like a sort of like no, non question, it, it like is an open ended question um, for Eileen, but oh, sorry. Yeah, you will go ahead. Oh, I have a question um, for you both because um, both of your projects are sort of dealing with uh, the connections between Shanghai and Hong Kong. And I think Eileen was uh, gesturing to this in the beginning part of her presentation that he wanted to talk about the connections between these two cities. And um, for Rita, uh, Rani Yu worked in the in Shanghai cinema, but she's, uh, I believe she's Cantonese and Stanley Kwan was making her, uh, as a Hong Kong director was making a remake or, you know, um, was a, making a in reenactment of all of um, Rani Yu's works in Shanghai. And, um, and for, um, I mean, uh, uh, I, I know that um, I remember uh, that uh, the first of uh, the Hua Chen Guliang series was uh, made in Shanghai, and then they eventually moved to Hong Kong, right, with the Shao brothers. I yes. Think. So I wonder if you could you could talk about the connections between the two cities. I mean, yeah, I can start. Um... Yeah, I mean, I there's a really fascinating scene, um, which I had to like kind of do a double take on. So like, uh, we know that that uh, part of um, center stage is filmed in Shanghai and that the film originally had Anita Mei um, Yanfang in mind, but she, you know, declined to film in Shanghai because of um, June 4th. Um, and so, you know, there's this real kind of, spatial triangulation between like Shanghai in the 1920s and like Shanghai in the 1990s and then like Hong Kong in both of those times. Um, and there's a really fascinating scene in center stage where I think it was like either new women or the goddess or whatever, but like they had to use um, a plastic kind of background in the movie. And this is like, like back in the 1920s or like the fictional 1920s, they had to use a plastic set. Um, and that was really highlighted as a plastic set. And then, um, you know, you withdraw from that narrative event and you see just Ren Liu talking to, to Tsai Chu Shang. And they're also talking with that scene behind their back. And so there's, I mean, I think it's an interesting way in which like center stage is signaling its production as a 1990s Hong Kong movie, reflecting on Hong Kong's involve, involvement during uh, Republican filmmaking's kind of political migration to Shanghai in the late 1930s. And like, um, like kind of there, there's a discussion of how Renly you had to um, like move to Hong Kong to like, you know, for political shelter and then back. Um, and so I think, you know, again, like that question of thinking about the past from the historical present, like what does it mean to think about that period from this particular moment in time? Like it's not necessarily a coincidence that um, Center Stage was filmed in, in the 90s, like in Hong Kong. Like I think that's all sort of really part of the, the message that he's trying to convey about, you know, loss um, and about, you know, things that can't be represented um, and things that are uh, misremembered and things that will have to be kind of dug out of the archive in particular ways. Um, yeah, thanks, Rimo, for the question. 
question. Yeah, and I just want to add in some historical information about the from the 1910s to the uh, late 1940s, because uh, Li Minwei's of Li Minwei and Yan Shenshen uh, then moved to Shanghai from Hong Kong in the mid 1920s and start and started their film company there in Shanghai. And also, as you mentioned, uh, the last episode of Tom Boy, I think it was in 1946, made in Hong Kong. Uh, and also, I think most of you know that Zhou Xuan, the, the great uh, actress, then moved to Hong Kong. So I think there were many connections between these two cities and uh, from, from the silent era. And now, even after uh, the, the uh, even until the 1990s, uh, Film filmmakers like Stanley Gwen started to look back to these histories, and and I think it's also a kind of dialogue with the history, and also a kind of reflection of the the self and identity, the self identity of Hong Kong is, uh, and its relationship with the mainland China or with Shanghai. Um, I think we can take like two more questions from the audience if they have them. Um, this like kind of maybe unrelated, but um, Eileen, I was thinking about, you know, the like lesbian scene in Big Road. Um, and I know Chris Berry has written about that scene. But yeah, I was wondering if the cross-dressing um, scenes that you write about, um, especially because you were you were pointing out this like, um, ambiguity between being subversive and like just conforming to certain stereotypes like do you see it interacting with other um, like explicitly or implicitly um, queer scenes in early Chinese film history like the one in Big Road? Um, actually yeah I know Chris Paris that article on, on Big Road but because uh, that was uh, a a life uh, a left wing filmmaking, so I think it's quite different from the the soft film like Tomboy. So I think uh, generally, uh, to to as as for Tomboy, I I didn't agree that much about a queer reading, because I mean from a contemporary perspective, we could find out a lot of possibilities in in reading those cross dressing scenes, but. I think at that moment in the specific historical context, it was just for the commercial purpose and all this so-called implications for same-sex desire was just a kind of, was still a kind of commercial strategies, but didn't provoke any, any uh, queer understanding or something like that. When you say commercial, like, do you mean for like a supposedly heterosexual audience or for like a queer baiting or queer baited audience? Oh, that's a good question that I didn't think about before, but I think it, it is still targeted the, the major uh, heterosexual audiences. And also uh, as for the big road, I think it was more like, it might not be homosexual, but more like, homosocial, like a kind of comradeship. So I have a follow-up question of Eileen too. Um, so I, I think it might be useful to look at the history of um, sexology uh, in, um, in Republican era. And I remember reading it um, from, I think it's Howard Chang's um, Gender and Sexuality in China. There's a collected volume um, about, and they were writing about how uh, the the term um, uh, 同性恋爱, 同性恋 was uh, adopted or translated um, in the Republican era. And that probably had, because I have the vague impression that, um, that the general attitude towards um, uh, homosexuality and uh, what was like relatively, um, they, were, they were not as, you know, um, so I mean, the Republican era uh, had more uh, like 
open attitudes towards homosexuality and probably that was because of i think it may it might be because of the long history um in uh in uh, chinese literature and chinese history but i wonder about you know the um it, it might be interesting to look at how traditional chinese values of gender and sexuality clash with uh western introduced um uh, terms, discourses on gender and sex that, that were introduced, I think, in the Republican era. Yes, thank you. That's helpful. And I, I didn't, I think I didn't go, go, go deep into those questions before. So thanks to you all. Okay, um, so if we don't have more questions, thanks everyone, everyone and Eileen for a great um, presentations. Um, yeah, look forward to Thank um, you so much. Thank you, Rita, for sharing. And Okay, thank you everyone so much for joining us uh, in the morning or <laughs> at night. Uh, and we will take a long break and we will uh, resume shortly. Thank you.